Okay, it is Wednesday, June 10th, and we are coming together for part two of our study on Romans 9, 10, and 11, Israel past, present, and future. As a quick review on Romans chapter 9, what we covered last time is we saw in the opening of it that Jew and Gentile are now saved in the same manner. We don't have the, the Gentile having a proselyte into Judaism. Now they come on equal footing, the two wave loaves that come to the Father through the shed blood of Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus. So now that the Jewish people and the Gentile people, oh, thank you, you're a little bigger. <laughs> okay, we'll see. We'll see which I can handle better. Thank you. Um, now that the, the Jewish people are not uh, the lead way, because when the Gentile proselyted in the Judaism, they came in to keep the law. And in not being able to keep the law, the sacrificial system was in place to be able to cover the sins that, that were still being committed, because we know no one can keep the, the law entirely. And we know if you error in one part of the law, you're guilty of it all. So it was not that if you do these, you're okay. It was an all or a nothing. So now that it's not through the law for that salvation and through the Gentile proselyting in, is God done with the Jew? That was a big question on the plate. Are the Jewish people now rejected? Not even is it a neutral, but is it now because the Jewish people did not as a whole, as a nation, did not accept the Messiah, has God said, I'm through with them, and I'm raising up a new group. This new group is what we now today call the church. It's the called out assembly, the ecclesia, whatever word you're accustomed to. Is it now that they have taken, superseded, the place of, uh, of the Jew, the place of, of um, Judaism? Can I say it that way safely? And maybe I can. I'm trying to think that one through. And um, I'm also trying to get Roger's Bible that he offered me up and open. So that's the big question on the plate. What about God's program with Israel? What about the plan God had? What about the promises God gave? Because I'll tell you, honestly, there is a strong teaching out in, unfortunately, good churches even, although I wonder how I can call them good, but in other ways they are. That, uh, that there is what's called replacement theology. God is done with the Jew. And now those promises have been sent over to the, quote, Christian world, and the Jew is left out. And they use proof to say, well, even Paul, he himself, even though he's Jewish, is now the missionary to the Gentiles. So God must be done with the Jews, or why isn't Paul worried about his Jewish people? Uh, we're going to answer whether he's worried about his Jewish people or not. We're going to see whether he isolated himself from them or whether he stayed in the midst of them. We're going to answer all these questions. But uh, um, right from the start, and I guess it's good to bring it out because Paul did right from the beginning. He told us in verse 1, there was like a triple oath of his care for his own people. Himself, his conscience, and the Holy Spirit. All three would not release him from his love for his people and reaching his own Jewish people. So right there, he's shutting down the argument on that basis. He even went so far as to say that if it were possible, he'd even give up his own salvation to give that to his Jewish brethren. Wow. Literally think that went through. Um, hardly a person would be willing to give up their salvation for someone that they dearly love let alone to say for, for those who are beyond that reach that aren't even part of the personal family and that show themselves to be an enemy to what's dear to you. Would you be so willing to say, you know, I would be willing to, in essence, if he give up his salvation, which he cannot do, but if he could, would he be willing, he's saying, I'd even be willing to go to hell that they might go to heaven. That's a giant spiritually in my book. I'm not there. I'm not willing to give up my salvation. I'll be frank and I'll be honest. <laughs> I don't want to give up my salvation. I'm thankful that's not on the plate and we don't have to go there. But it just shows me his love. Having said that, I want you to know I also have a sincere love to reach my own people. To know the love that has enriched my life. The love that is the only thing I wouldn't want to give up in my life. I think I could, you could, you know, talk me giving up anything else except that relationship, that love between 
uh, my Messiah and myself. Uh, and that is not to put me on any level. I just don't want you to think I don't care either because I do. I, I absolutely care. We looked at the fact that God made more than one covenant with the people of Israel. That five out of eight of the covenants we are introduced to in the, the original uh, covenant, the original testament, what you call the Old Testament, five out of eight of those covenants were made with Israel. We're going to focus heavily on the Messianic and the Kingdom Covenant. The Messianic Covenant is the coming of Messiah, coming of Messiah for salvation, coming of Messiah to be king, setting up his kingdom. Now we have the privilege of realizing that's one Messiah coming two different times. One's to deal with our sin issue as our Savior, as our Messiah, and the other to deal with being the head ruler sitting on the throne of David from Jerusalem the kingdom promises that God made to Israel that are literal land promises. Uh, we saw that those promises for the land and the promises sitting on the throne were to the physical Jew. And I think it was Rhonda, I'll give credit where credit is due, who came up with a good way to cut through the red tape and said it's a blood thing. It's got to be in the blood. When we're talking about being Jewish, that's exactly what we're talking about. Not the religion called Judaism, you need to separate that, but when the promises were made to the physical Jewish descendants, then it was the bloodline that was being talked about. But we saw that just because you were Jewish didn't guarantee you were going to enter into those spiritual, or I'm sorry, those uh, earthly promises, well, and spiritual also, because we saw that Abraham had two children, one called Ishmael, one called Yitzhak. And we see that the promises went from Abraham to Yitzhak. That there were other promises made for Ishmael, but the promise of the land, the land promises were given to Yitzhak. Then we come down another generation and we again see a split because we now have twins. We don't have two different mamas. We've got one mama, Ishmael and Esau had, uh, Esau, sorry, Ishmael and Yitzhak, Isaac, had two different mamas. We, we see... Um, Yaakov and Esau, Jacob and Esau, had one mom. So now we're in, on the same page with mom. What about them? We see the sovereignty of God. The promise went through Yaakov, Jacob. It's going to go through his 12 sons. It's going to uh, be finally, we get the name Jew when we get all the way down to Judah. We don't even have the word Jew way back up at Abraham. But we see God choosing a line. And the question then is raised. Okay, we're elected for salvation. God chooses. Does that mean that God's arbitrarily choosing? I like you and I'll pick you and I don't like you and I won't pick you. Well, the understanding when you don't know the Hebrew idiom of Esau I've hated and Jacob I've loved opens it up to that and then people say, well then I can stand before God one day if he didn't choose me and say it's your fault God, you weren't fair, you didn't give me a chance. Well, if God says that he so loved the world that whosoever believes would have eternal life, then obviously he did not arbitrarily pick and say, you get to have salvation and you don't. But we do see that God is sovereign. He is in control and he is all-knowing. Remember, he's omniscient, omnipresent, and what's my third? He's all-knowing, all everywhere, and all-powerful. I don't know which I left out, but anyway, so we're answering those questions, and basically, we had to come down to the same thing that Job discovered, and he was one of the earliest patriarchs. He lived at least at the time of Abraham, if not a little before Abraham, even, but right in that time, and he learned the same thing, that God, being sovereign, does get to set the rules. He does say so be it, this is the way that it goes. When God said to Job, were you there when I told the waters where to stop on the sand? Were you there when I gathered the wind in my fist? Well, God created this world. He right. created a world for us to love and enjoy and be blessed in. He created a world to glorify Him. And in that world, He is the one who gets to make the rules. And when he says that, that the only way to the Father is through the shed blood of the Son, then that's the only way to the Father, whether you like it or not. <laughs> I'm on my soapbox. But it is God's way. And then in that way, and God knowing, 
humanity individually. He knows those who are going to be receptive. He knows those who are going to be, I don't know whether way to put it, bad. And he uses both according to his purposes. So we saw that he pardoned Pharaoh's heart. He didn't do that where Pharaoh could have said one day, well, it's your fault, God. If you would have left me alone, I would have turned to you. No, we see in Scripture, it's shown to us also many a time, Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Pharaoh hardened his own heart. And then we saw that the way God hardened his heart was God brought light to him. And if you put clay and you put wax in the light in the sun, and I'll tell you, spell it S-O-M, one melts and one hardens. God knew that heart would harden. He used Pharaoh to bring the children of Israel to a point that they would cry out to their living God, that they'd look back to him, that he could rescue them and bring them out. So this is how he works through even the good and the bad and why we're told that we are the, the pottery, he is the potter. And does the pottery get the right to say, make me this way, I'll do this, I want to be there? No, the pottery is made according to what the potter knows is best for that lump of clay. So we, we cannot talk back to our potter. I'll tell you the day that you decide and are able to create your own world, then you can make your own rules. <laughs> but I'm right. very thankful that the one overriding attribute that we see down to today, from the very beginning with the dawn to today, is we see God's mercy. We see grace extended. I'll be honest, it is a wonder that any of us are saved. We in our sinful natures do not turn naturally to God. We go off the path we should be on. We know that God made everyone with a God-shaped vacuum to worship a God, to know a God, to have a relationship with a God. Now I should say it because God made it to worship the God, to have that intimate relationship with the God, because there is only one true and living God. But man chooses to try to put something else in there, whether they literally put a, a God of this world as in an idol that you see more in, in jungles, but you see in religions, or whether it's something that man makes a God out of. The love of money is the root of all evil. We see people who worship money. Money is their God. We can see many things that are put into that position. And because they are trying to fill that God-shaped vacuum with anything and everything but God, they're never content. The happiness isn't there. The peace isn't there. And their future is not where they want it to be. But God made each one with that capacity to know and to love the one true and living God who can fill that void who wants that personal relationship, who does everything he can to draw all mankind to him, rob heaven of its glory, of the one called the Son, to bring him down into a sin-soaked world. It wasn't a pleasant place to come, and he wasn't born as the king in the palace with a silver spoon in his mouth. He started out in the, the trough that you fed animals in. He was born into a family that was poor, he didn't live the life of luxury here, and his whole purpose of coming was to die. That's great love. No greater love as a man than this that he lay down his life for another. That is what we see. That is what God has done for us. So no one can point a finger in the face of God and say, it's your fault I'm not able to come into your heaven. You didn't love me. You didn't give me a chance. You didn't show. No, in fact, even creation which just happens to be worldwide. <laughs> you can't get away from creation. You can be in the deepest, darkest jungle and you still see creation. And even in that alone shows the mind a master designer. We were talking about this earlier today in a study I was in, the magnanimity of creation, the, the flowers in a jungle that show an intricate designer that, that took time to make these flowers and they reproduce after their own kind and you don't have bedlam and chaos in the midst of this. 
That's just the flowers. Now go into the fishies in the sea. Go into the, the trees and the, and the go into the. Uh, oh, I'm my mind. I'm blocking myself. Humanity. We see. Everything points to the fact that there is a God. And I'm saying this long and hard because I don't know everyone within my hearing. And my concern is people can put on a front and they can profess with their mouths that they love the Lord and everything's fine with their soul and they don't have it in their heart. They've never made a personal commitment to this God that I'm speaking about. And the only way to spend an eternity with this one true and living God who loves us so is by his rules. And Yeshua, Jesus said it himself, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man comes unto the Father but through me. He didn't say through any other way, but he made it so everyone around the world can know of that love. No one will be without excuse before God. And yet everyone has to choose it for themselves. You cannot bank on it because of a family you were born into, a country you were born into, whatever else you want to put in. If you cannot say that there is a time and a point that you made it personal, you said to God, your maker, I want this relationship with you through Jesus who died in my place, that I can have this with you, then you are outside of this love that Shaul Paul was saying is for everyone. So take it to heart if you need to. God will judge one day all mankind who have not accepted him, and not one will ever have an excuse where God will say, oh, okay, then I'll allow you in. That's a concern to my heart. I love you all. I want to see you all in heaven with me. So take that to heart. If you've never made it personal, don't miss heaven by 18 inches. You know it in your head, but you never brought it into your heart. So realize we have a God who loves, a God who did everything, so all you have to do is freely accept. But we have a God who will judge who will bring you up on that day and say, what did you do with my son? Did you reject or did you accept? And by the way, those who think there's a third place and in between, there isn't. Not accepting is rejecting. There isn't any room for an in-between. Okay, off my soapbox, that just came out of my heart because I love you. We see in a God the long-suffering for the Jewish people. We see that God did not make a final rejection, and we were coming into that in verse 25 of Romans 9. We had that uh, presented to us. We had uh, Hosea, Hosea, who God's using for an example, and if you don't know his history, I, I told it in short last week also, that this one had a wife. The wife went off and committed adultery on him. He brought her back in his love for her. A little while later, she goes off again. He brought her back again. As this was a repetitive happening, Hosea even asked God at one point, what do I do with her? And God said, bring her back. Love her. What God was saying is, overall, you are showing my love to my people. Because what do we see in, in the children of Israel in their history? Exactly what I just said. They're right with their God, they love their God, then they forget their God, and they go off, and they're in the world doing their own thing and God has to bring them back to get them back on track again. But each time, he kept bringing them back. He kept bringing them back. He kept bringing them back. And here is what he is showing when the question is raised again, what are we going to do with the Jew? Has he, the Jew now been forsaken? Has the Jew now been disqualified? Has the Jew now been put on a back burner? Has the Jew now been replaced? Well, just as there was no final rejection with Hosea, there is no final rejection with Israel. God shows in these scriptures also that there was always a remnant. God has always kept some who believe. 
even though it may have gotten down to a very small number, and he brings it out, that the children of Israel were so numerous that it was like the sand on the sea, yet the few who stayed true to God were a small remnant. But there was always the remnant. And that's where we pick up all, also the um, example of verse 27 was... <laughs> We gotta love them. <laughs> I think we're all coming down three miles. I'm awake now. <laughs> Sorry, Cindy. That's like the worst for her because Shadow was right next to her. Oh, come on, that's only a small bite. <laughs> <laughs> there was no bite. We have no idea what set her off, but she has been. Uh, she's been taken out into captivity, but we'll bring her back. No worries. <laughs> love for her will go on. <laughs> Uh, and if you ever want to see an example of unconditional love, look at a dog. Look at a dog to their master. And especially if you've never seen Shadow and Roger, oh my goodness. She adores him. She worships the ground he walks on. <laughs> and I think to myself so often when I see that, oh Lord, let that be my heart for you. Let me worship the ground you walk on. Let me have eyes for no one but you. Let me just want to be at your back and call and do for you. You know that's that's what's precious of our our um, created animals that we can learn from. Anyway, <laughs> um, Isaiah also in verse 29 we looked at it last week that he said, "Unless the Lord of Sabaoth, that's the Lord of the hosts of heaven, that's the, all the angelic hosts and the spherical multitude, the stars that are called by name, there's another one." Do we think twinkle, twinkle, little star? Each one has five points and looks all alike, like the stars on our flag. <laughs> Have you looked through the Hubble telescope? Oh my goodness. Again, the magnanimity of this creation of our God. And he is saying that, that he has all of that. And yet he cared enough about Israel that he kept a remnant, or they would have been like Sodom and Amorah. That's Sodom and Gomorrah. And let me ask you, anyone who's got the answer, raise a hand and we'll, we'll get you to unmute. Where is Sodom and Gomorrah today? Do we see them? Are they active cities? No, no. Some believe they're in the depths of the Dead Sea, and there's good reason to believe that. It's the right area, but they're gone. And God is saying in verse 29 that if he hadn't had that love for Israel, that's how Israel would have gone. But he saw to it that he drew that nucleus that would have that heart. And that's where we're picking up that there was still a remnant. I'm not sure if we looked it up the last time, so let me give you a couple of verses to prove what I'm saying. Isaiah chapter... Yes, Isaiah chapter 10 okay. and verse 21. And we'll also see, okay, we're also going to see Isaiah 1 9. In fact, I'll start with Isaiah 1 9. Yeshua 1 9, um, because that's the one that speaks of the Lord of Sabaoth that we just talked about. Isaiah 1 and verse 9. I get these single letters on my phone. There we go. Okay, come on. Come on. The baby it. Okay. Verse 9 says, unless the Lord of hosts, that's the Lord of Sabaoth, had left us a few survivors, we would be like Sodom, we would be like a Gomorrah, Amorah. Okay, that's, I had set up for you, but there it is in living proof. Now go to chapter 10 in Isaiah. And in chapter 10, we're going to look at verse 21. And Isaiah 10, 21 says, I gotta just that's not what the verse says. <laughs> okay. There we go. Okay. A remnant will return. The remnant of Yaakov, of Jacob, to the mighty God. See, right there in Isaiah's day, they were going to go off into captivity and under Assyria. Assyria was going to swallow up what was called Israel, the ten northern tribes. And God said, yet, a remnant will return. God's mercy <clears throat> revealed that he was always holding on to a remnant, that even when Israel went under the harsh judgment of captivity, there was still a remnant that would be brought back. 
We see them brought back from Assyrian captivity, which also got swallowed up in Babylonian captivity. We see many a time, even to the point in 1948, they're back in the land. That's by virtue of our God holding on to that remnant. Most of that land is like he had said before. They're the sand of the sea that don't know and don't flood me. That I have a remnant. I'm keeping a remnant. We know Israel will go into the tribulation. In that tribulation, there will be those who will finally cry out unto their God. The same way we saw Israel do in Egypt. Finally, there will be those who will cry out, looking to their God, the one true and living God, pleading for him to raise up a redeemer for them. And we know that's when Messiah Yeshua will be returning. And they will say, Baruch HaBab Hashem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10 being fulfilled, where they will see him who was pierced. They will mourn for him then as one mourns for an only son. They're going to realize this one who came before was their God, is their Messiah. The piercing is the nail prints in the hands, and this is when the spiritual eyes are now open and they receive him as Messiah. The believing remnant will then go into that millennial kingdom where Israel's promises that we've talked about earlier will be completely fulfilled. But again, how is Israel receiving this now? Because we've now said the law, which was to bring her to God, is off the, the page. That now it's been replaced by the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus. Well, that's a little inaccurate in a statement because in the law was a sacrificial system that made way for that shed blood of Yeshua Jesus to fulfill the law to take care of the condemnation of the law, not to do away with the law. And this is the misnomer and misunderstanding. And I think it tends, because to be brutally honest, many people do not want the Lord to be Lord of their lives. They believe in him, they want to accept him as savior, but they want control. They want the reins to their life. And in that rebellious spirit, they said they bristle at law. Why do I, you know, I don't need law. I don't want law. We could keep the law. The law has been done away with because now we've got Yeshua Jesus. Well, Paul says, because we're forgiven, does that give us the license to now go sin, to go do what we want? Now it doesn't matter because we know we're forgiven, past, present, future. So throw all care to the wind. We don't need law and we don't have to abide by it. And his answer, mine too, may it never be. No, now with the spirit within us, we ought to be able to conform ourselves to that law of God. Because did you hear what I called it? The law of God. This wasn't the law of man. This was the law of God. Do you really think that God's changed from his holy standard? Do you really think that he wants to accept anything less from his people than that they are striving to meet that standard? This is our walk to be sanctified. This is our walk to grow. Sanctified is to be set apart unto God, to be pulled out of the world, and to be in His army, to be in His service, to be pleasing to Him so He can use us. And if we're all about doing our own thing, and we have that rebellious spirit, then He is not our Lord, and we are not walking in conformity with Him. And we are saying, I don't like law. I don't like being under law. Well, then I say, check your heart. Again, have you ever gotten it from the brain to the heart? Because a heart for our Lord is going to bow our head and accept his rule and want to live according to his rule. So law is not done, gone, antiquated, forget. And we see it all over the New Covenant, the Brit Chadashah. When you look at Shaul Paul's teachings, law is all over it. We're still not given a license to kill. We're still not given a license to covet. We're still not given a license to steal. I could go on through all of them, but the most important, we're never given freedom to put anything in the place of our God. He needs to be number one, and that means he pulls the control. He tells us, and we say, yes, Lord, let me do your will. Even the Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus himself said, I came to do the will of my Father. And we see that total submission in the garden when he prayed, 
Let this cup pass before me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And in that, he laid down his life for another. So all of this we're seeing behind these words. And we're going to go into that heavily now. How is the Jew saved now then? The law is done away with for salvation. Are they out in left field? Are they replaced? How do they get saved? What do we do? What are we looking at? And we're going to answer some other hard questions as we go along the way. So let's pick up. I think I've done, oh, I mean this one. I think I've done, yes, I have done 29. Let's start with verse 30. Okay, what shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith. Okay, what's this saying? Let's break it down. The Gentiles who didn't pursue, they didn't run swiftly, they weren't trying to catch something, they weren't in pursuit, showing an earnest endeavor, they weren't seeking after something eager, eagerly to acquire it. If you want something you want so badly, you're not allowing anything to get in your way, you are going for it. That's the type of pursuit we're seeing here. And it's saying that the Gentiles didn't pursue through the law that way, yet they attained, they got a hold of, they grasped, they seized, they laid hold of something. What did they lay hold of? They attained righteousness. Okay, so they got that righteousness. How did they get it? The next phrase tells us, even the righteousness which is by faith. Out of a source of faith, they were able to attain righteousness. This is where it's a whole new mindset, especially for the Jewish person who has been taught law, law, law. Keep the law, keep the law, keep the law. Only way to get to God is keeping this law. Well, we know we as Jewish people couldn't do that. And we also know that we're going to see a time in the beginning of the church family that the question is asked, do we put the Gentiles under that bondage, that law? Are we going to put that heavy burden on them when we couldn't keep it? Are we going to expect them to keep it? And of course, we see that, that what we're being shown here is that's not what's happening. God didn't say, I'll replace the Jews and now the Gentiles, you come in and you keep law. No, that's not what's going on. The Gentiles attain what the Jewish people were striving for through the keeping of the law, they attained that righteousness. But how did they attain it? They attained it by the source of faith. We'll move up. Let's keep reading. But Israel, pursuing a law of righteousness. Okay, they're trying also. The Jewish people want to attain this also. They want to get that righteousness, but they did not arrive at it. Uh, they did not arrive at that law. They weren't able to keep the law. What law did time out? They're talking about the Mosaic law. So they're pursuing also. They want righteousness the same as we just said the Gentiles wanted it. The Gentiles got it by faith. The Jew, did the Jew get it by the Mosaic law? No, it wasn't attained. There wasn't one Jew ever that lived perfectly and was to be able to obtain it by law. So verse 32 says, why? Because they, the Jewish people in verse 31, Israel, because they did not pursue it by faith, but as though it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. Okay, before we get to the stumbling stone, notice the first part of this, by faith. Okay, it, it said uh, <clears throat> they did not pursue it by faith. They added man's responsibility of keeping the law. Now here's where God's sovereignty steps in and God says, again, this is how I make the role. You can come to me by faith. You're putting your faith in Yeshua, Jesus. You're not putting faith in your works. Your works will never get you there. But the other side of God's sovereignty, man's responsibility and his only part of responsibility is to come to pursue it by faith. Not by works, but by faith. The Jewish people were still trying to earn it, do the works, and in the, the process of doing so, they missed the whole picture of the law. What they missed, they stumbled over the stone. Okay, when we're talking about they stumbled over the stone, let me read you 33, and we'll still go back and talk about what this stumbling stone is. 
that we've got to know where it is. We've got to have a little more information. So verse 33 tells us, just as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion, that's the name for Israel, for Jerusalem in particular, a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, a rock that offends. He who believes in him, big clue people, <laughs> him, will not be disappointed. When we realize the full depth of the meaning of verse 33, it helps us understand verse 32. Because we now see that we're not talking about a stone that I could pick up in the garden that was on the path and they tripped over it. But that analogy has been given. They were on the path to God. God brought them the way to go in this path. And they stumbled right there. They stumbled over that stone. And that stone happens to be a hymn. Because, and, and not H-Y-M-N that you sing, a him as an H-I-M, as a person. Because it's telling us there that that rock that offends, um, he who believes in him, in the rock that offends, will not be disappointed. So we need to understand fully what we're saying. Because as they're in that pursuit for righteousness by works, according to the Mosaic Law, they miss it and they stumble. Now, I want to also throw out for two reasons. For in, in case if anyone is not here by the time we get to chapter 11, they need to hear this loud and clear now because I don't want to ever leave it on this and the teaching go out from here. That see, the Jews have stumbled, they tripped over the stone, they tripped over the rock, and they're, they're now um, out in left field. Okay, Romans 11 says, yes, they stumbled, but so as not to fall. What it's saying in there, what it's meaning, and I, you know, we're headed toward the 20s when we get to that verse. Um, we will take it, we, because we'll go verse by verse. What it is saying is, they didn't fall down where they can't get back up. You know that commercial, help, I've fallen and I can't get back up. <laughs> well, God sent the help. They stumbled over, and we're going to identify who the rock is, who this hymn is. But they didn't stumble so as to fall down completely where they can never get back up. No, they, they were not brought down and knocked out. It wasn't the rock that rocked the giant to sleep and he never woke up again and his head came off of him. This was a stumbling, just like when you're on a path and you stumble but you don't fall. That's what is being said there. We'll see that in its entirety when we get to chapter 11. But now back here. Let's identify what this stone is. Remember, we got Jewish people that he's talking about. So they're going to know their background. I'm taking you to Yeshaya, Isaiah again. I should have told you to stay there or keep a finger there. Go to chapter 8, and we're going to start with verse 13. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 13 says, It is the Lord of hosts. That's again, Adonai Sabaot, the one that we talked about in the other scriptures in Isaiah. It's the Lord of the hosts whom you should regard as holy, and he shall be your fear. He shall be your dread. Then he shall become a sanctuary. But to both the house of Israel, or the houses of Israel, this is Israel and Judah, a stone to strike, a rock to stumble over, and a snare and a trap for the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Many will stumble over them. Then they will fall and be broken, they will even be snared and caught. There are those who trip, and they trip so as to get hurt. Again, not knocked out as in death, but they're missing it. They're stumbling. They're tripping. And it said it very clearly um, that this is, and I'm backing up to verse 13, it's the Lord of hosts. It's the Lord Adonai, Sabaoth, that they're tripping over, that they're missing, that they are not understanding that this is their way into the presence of God. Let me take you from Yeshaya to Psalm. In fact, stay with Isaiah. If you can keep a finger there, I can't, but we're going to come back to it in a moment. I want to take you first to Psalm 118 and verse 22. And again, remember, these are, uh, for any who were in uh, their religious beliefs, these were scriptures they were, were familiar with. Psalm 118, even... Uh, connected with Pesach, with Passover. Verse 22, when they're reading the Hillel, this is part of it um, at that time. Psalm 118.22, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. 
if you've been with me through Passover, you're saying, oh, I remember that. I remember when she brought out the building of the, the temple, that there was a stone that was rejected by the builders. It came up from the quarry. It was odd. It didn't fit. They, they tossed it down in the Kidron Valley. Then they got to the end of building the temple. They were ready to put in the cornerstone, which is the most important. The whole foundation will heave aside and rest on this cheap cornerstone. And it was missing. And they asked for the quarry to send it up. And the quarry said, we did send it up a long time ago. And someone remembered, oh, could it be that weird stone we rejected? And they went down and they got it. They brought it back. They put it into place. And it was the cheap cornerstone. And it became the foundation of the temple. This is what we're being told here. In Isaiah 8, where we had it identified as the Messiah that the builders rejected. Israel as a whole, as a nation, rejected Messiah. They did trip over it. They cast Messiah down into the Kidron Valley, so to speak. But again, do we see God say, you blew it? It's all over? Forget it? No. Remember that stone was brought up. It was placed in. It did become the chief cornerstone. Now, go with me back to Yeshia, Isaiah 28, 16. We're building on the same theme of this stone that, that's the rock of stumbling. Isaiah 28 and verse 16. And we read there in verse 16. Isaiah 28, verse 16. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Adonai Elohim says, Behold, I'm laying in Zion, in Jerusalem, in Israel, a stone, a test of stone, a costly cornerstone for the foundation, firmly placed. He who believes in it will not be, and this version renders it disturbed. Remember when we read earlier in Romans that he who believes in this rock will not be disappointed. This is saying the same thing. It's just a different word, but Isaiah is saying this, this cornerstone, it was a costly cornerstone. It was firmly placed where it belongs, and the one who believes in it won't be disappointed, won't be disturbed, won't be let down. This is what they want. That's what's being said now in Isaiah. Romans was building on Isaiah because Isaiah came first and was written first. And we know that how costly was it? It cost Yeshua his life. Now, thankfully, God gave him the resurrection power and the abundant life that comes after. But this is, this is costly. This was not something, you know, minimal. We're going to go to Kepha's words now. Uh, in his first book that he wrote called First Peter, and Kepha and Peter are one and the same. In First Peter, he refers to this rock of stumbling in chapter 2 and verses 6 through 8. And he also is building on what Isaiah had said. Remember, Kepha's Jewish. His study is in Isaiah, the prophet. He knows what the prophet said, and he builds on that as the Holy Spirit brought it to his remembrance. For this, verse 6, is contained in Scripture, and now he quotes, Behold, I lay in Zion, a choice stone, a precious cornerstone. He who believes in him will not be disappointed. We have a tie-in now. We've got Isaiah, we've got Paul, Sha'ol Paul, and we've got Kepha, Peter. We've got three Jews, three different places, two different time periods, and they're all referring to this stone, this cornerstone, this chief stone, this tried stone, and they all are saying that this is the Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus. And we, we see that in verse 5 up above of what I just read in 1 Peter 2. Let me take you to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Again, there's a reference to this stone. Let's see what it was told to the people in Corinth. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 23, and in this, and by the way, there's many more scriptures on the rock that you can follow all the way through in Israel's history, through the scriptures, and it is always Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus. And never were they cast out, they stumbled, but there's always those who came in to believe. Chapter 1, verse 23, 1 Corinthians, the people who lived in Corinth, that we preach... Messiah, your scripture may say Christ, that's the English for Messiah, it means anointed one. We preach Christ, Messiah, crucified. Okay? Shaul Paul saying, we, we preach it, we tell you that this one that you call 
that we, we're calling Christ, Messiah, whatever of those names you're comfortable with right now, this one was crucified. To the Jews, a stumbling block. Okay, I don't think it can be any more clear now. We've got the same author in Romans saying that there's a stone that's a stumbling block. And now he is saying to another people that he wrote, this stumbling block uh, is, is Christ, is the one who was crucified. To the Gentiles, is foolishness. But it was a stumbling block to the Jewish people. Why? Because, again, they were not looking for the suffering Messiah. They were not looking for one who would deal with the sin issue. They wanted the Messiah who was going to rule and reign. They wanted the one who was going to break Rome's bondage over them and take off the yoke that they were under, was going to raise Israel up as a head nation, and the rest of the world would come to them for blessing. They knew their scriptures. They knew of the promises, but they should have also known of this issue that had to be taken care of first. And anyone who was hung on a tree, that was condemnation to them. It was uh, considered that, you know, that by God that they were condemned. Crucifixion was the hanging on the tree. The Lord took on condemnation for us when he became the sin sacrifice in our place. So yes, it was an offense to the Jewish people, but it was what was necessary for salvation. And they have to come to see and receive suffering Messiah, who was and is the Son of God, who could die in their stead, not for himself, but for whosoever, so that they could come into that right fellowship with God. And when the veil of blindness is removed, the spiritual eyes are open, they see and they understand, and instead of stumbling over this rock now, they receive him. And remember, those who receive him will not be... Remember the words? Disappointed. They will not be, um, what was the other one? I can't even think myself now. Close to disappointed. But anyway, ashamed. They, they will find this is what they've been looking for. How do they find it? Remember back in Romans 9, we're looking at it, that it was missed. The Jewish people missed it because they didn't pursue it by faith. So if they missed it by not pursuing by faith, then how do they get it? They get it by pursuing it by faith, okay? Now, it was a stumbling stone that was laid in a specific place. We know the Lord did his ministry there in Israel. He promised this to the nation of Israel, to be their Messiah, to be their Savior. Let me show you very quickly. That, um, hold on to 1 Corinthians. Maybe I can do it first. I'm going to take you back all the way to the beginning to bear a sheet, but let me see... I don't remember if I can do this in this order. Whoops. Whoops. Okay, come on up. What did this just do? Okay. Um, oh, I lost my... Well, since I lost it, you can hold on and let me just read Genesis to you, and then we'll come back to Corinthians, okay? Genesis, I'm going to go to chapter 49. Bear sheet 49 and verse 24. And in Genesis 49, 24, we read, But his... Am I in the right? Okay. Am I in the right one? Genesis 49, 24. Sorry, I'm not sure I got into the right scripture. Genesis 49, I am in it. Okay, then it's going to make sense when I read it. <laughs> Sorry, folks. Genesis 49 and verse 24, we read there, But his bow remained firm, and his arms were agile from the hands of the mighty one of Yaakov, from there is the shepherd, here we go, from there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. Wow. So here it's telling you who is the shepherd, Man. the mighty one of Jacob. I mean, who is the stone, the shepherd, the mighty one of Jacob, and that his bow remained firm. Okay, tie that in with 1 Corinthians 10. And by the way, as I mentioned also, and I think 1 Corinthians will bring this out for us, you see the rock follow the children of Israel through their history. Um, the, the, they were watered from the rock, um, so much from the rock. But let me see what 1 Corinthians 10 says. We're going to read verses 1 and 4. 1 says, For I do not want you unaware, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, okay, fellow believers, that our fathers, now he's talking to Jewish believers, because our fathers are Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that they were all under the cloud, 
Okay, remember when the cloud was over them in the desert? They followed under the cloud. All passed through the sea. Remember the parting of the Red Sea? So you know he's talking to Jewish people about their Jewish history. Now, keeping that in mind, verse 4, And all drank the same spiritual drink, for they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, and that rock was Messiah. He spells it out. We're not given any room to wonder who the rock is. This rock that brought offense was the one called Yeshua Jesus, and the offense is the cross. That they didn't want it to be that bloody death that is condemned by law. Anyone who hangs on the tree is cursed. That's the law. Well, remember, he took the curse of the law for us. Instead, they wanted that ruling, reigning Messiah, but they needed to understand that that cross, that offense, had to be dealt with. It had to be... Um, Messiah had to suffer that for the people because they're never going to uh, be able to atone for their own sins. This is where they had to let go of their pride. I can save myself. I can work it up. I can be good enough. I can please God. I haven't done anything bad. I haven't murdered. I haven't done the stealing. I haven't coveted. I've lived a good life. Well, that's pride. And they had to be stripped of that pride and humble themselves to accept that this one died in their place, took on the curse of the law, that we could be free from that curse and that condemnation. That's a rock that snares the Jewish people to this day. Many times when we are sharing our faith with our Jewish people, we will hear them say, I don't want someone to have to die for me. I don't want to have to believe that. I don't want someone hurting because it was for me. Well, they have to humble themselves and accept that, that this is the way that God chose for their atonement to come. And when they do put their faith in that, they will not be ashamed. They will not be disappointed. They will see the beauty of that love that's exemplified, no greater love than what we see in what Yeshua Jesus did. And by the way, if I didn't bring it out in your uh, King James in Isaiah 28, 16, when we look at that, the end of it there, in your old King James says, shall not be confounded. That's, that's not just a confusion, but that's being put to shame. It was a shame to be hung on a tree. That was just beyond what the, the Jewish mind could bear because of the, the law saying, cursed is any man who hangs on the tree. So, again, all those words are saying the same thing. They're just given in different languages and to different people, uh, just like we use different words today, you know, for understanding. So, we see now what the problem is. The Jewish people have stumbled. There's a rock of offense there. They have to pursue this relationship with their God by faith, not by the works of the law, but by faith. The Gentiles that they are hearing that have it, have pursued it by faith. They did receive it by faith. Now the Jewish people have to realize this and humble themselves to accept it in that way also. And we go on again realizing nowhere is Shaul Paul saying that the Jews can't get it. The Jews blew it. It's over for them. He's saying they have to come through by faith also. This is the way to God. The only way to please God is by our faith. They have to come into it that way, but he never says it's over for them. Furthermore, further proof, look at chapter 10. Now we're ready for it. Okay, there we go, I can get there. And we read right off at the start, the first word, brethren. That term has affection in it. You don't call a stranger brethren. You don't call someone you don't care about brethren. In this book, Brethren, that Shaul Paul is writing to, he's writing to the Romans, to the Roman church. There are Gentiles that he's calling brethren. He's seeing them as part of the family. There are Jews in there also. He's one. And there are others also, because we know the first century church was founded on uh, by the Jewish people. And then the Gentiles came into that also. But it was started with the apostles. All the apostles were Jewish. Okay, so this term... This affectionate term, 
is reaching to Gentiles as well as, as well as to Jewish people, and he's saying again, you're going to hear Shaul Paul's heart. You're not going to hear him say, I'm sorry, Jewish people, it's over. You condemn, it's done. No, what do you hear? My heart's deepest desire, my prayer to God for Israel is for their salvation. Now you may have that it says my heart's prayer for them rather than for Israel. Um, the better text do read for them, but who's the them that he's referring to? The ones that he's just been talking about in verses 31 and 32. He's been revealing that, that the Jewish people have stumbled. So his heart for these Jewish people that have stumbled is not a hard heart that says, you blew it, I'm done, forget it, I'm going away from you, I'm going to go to just to the Gentiles. Yes, God sends them in ministry to the Gentiles. I think so the Gentiles can be enlightened in the Jewish ways and get the full picture of the meaning. But he didn't walk away from his Jewishness, from his love for his Jewish people, and he's saying, my deepest heart's desire. That's the depths of the heart. That's where the soul is. That's where it, what it means the most, what we consider the most dear to us. And in that, he says, is Israel. I pray for their salvation. He is not saying they cannot be saved. He says, I'm praying. I'm crying out. I'm desiring uh, that, that this is what I want. The Greek, the idea behind the words that are used in the Greek, is this is an all-consuming desire. This is his whole fiber of his being is crying out for this, is consuming him. He's praying. He is supplicating. It, the root word means to want so much is as if to beg. He's begging God for the salvation of Israel. He's praying for them. He's praying in behalf of them that they might be saved. He never considered their rejection and their stumbling over Messiah was a hopeless situation. Instead, he's showing you they can yet be saved. That should settle it right there, but we're going to go on with a whole chapter of proof here. For since, verse 2, they are unaware of God's way of making people righteous. Instead, they seek to set up their own. They have not submitted themselves to God's way of making people righteous. Okay, I think that may be self-explanatory, but let's break it down. Let's take it phrase by phrase. In another, that was a complete Jewish Bible. In the New American, it starts out and says, For I testify about them. Okay, I testify about these Jewish people that have stumbled. They have a zeal for God. And if you're testifying, you're going on record. You're saying, I'm a witness to this. I testify. I can affirm in a personal way. You cannot testify if it's not personal. If you are called in as an eyewitness, you can't say, well, so-and-so saw, and I'm reporting what they saw. You have to say, I saw. Paul is saying that from that personal, he knows personally. He, he has um, this experience with these Jewish people that they have a zeal for God, okay? If you have a zeal for something, you love it. When you say today that you're passionate for something, that's a zeal for something. I hope people see my zeal for my God. I hope they see my zeal to reach my Jewish people, like Paul also. This is what he's saying. I, I, they had a zeal for God. There is a, a Jewish people who really want God, want that relationship with God, but they've got to do it the right way. He says they've got that zeal. They're going headstrong. You know who this reminds me of, by the way? Uh, yeah, I think this is when Paul was called Shaol. And you think maybe this is when he's on the road to Damascus and he's going to get all the Christians he can get and he's throwing them in and women into jail and he's hoping that they get the death sentence. He's helping put them to death. He held the cloaks of those who martyred Stephen, our first martyr, Stephen. He was the one holding the cloaks. That means he was responsible for bringing up the charges against Stephen. He's putting them to death, and he's doing God a favor. And God had to literally knock him off his high horse, put him on his tukas, <laughs> and say, 
Why are you persecuting me? Wow! Who, God? Who, Lord? <clears throat> and he gets his spiritual eyes open, and we know the rest of the story. That's what Paul could identify with. He knows that zeal, but that zeal is false in its placement. It's a knowledge, but it's not knowledge that's fully correct. It's not that they don't know God experientially. They know God through their, their way of looking at God and coming to God, and they're, they're refusing the revelation of the Messiah. Remember, we've got a whole book called The Revelation of Yeshua HaMashiach. The, the, our last book in the Bible, but here they were missing it because Messiah came in a way that they stumbled. Wait a minute. Our Messiah is not going to die on a cross. In fact, I'll be very honest. I heard a rabbi that we're... Okay, i got to be careful. I heard a rabbi recently say, well, you sure, Jesus, there's no way he could be the Messiah. Look what happened. He ended up in death. He didn't end up in, in winning the victory. He lost. They don't have that full understanding, and that's what they were seeing. This Messiah went down in flames. He was crucified. He couldn't be our Messiah. If he was a Messiah, where's our kingdom? Where's our promises? Why isn't Israel the head nation? Why do we have all these problems today? If he was our Messiah, what hope is there for us? Well, hello. There's all the hope in the world, and Paul's pointing them to it. You're going to see that this is your Messiah. You're going to come to understand by faith. He took care of your sin problem first, the greater of the two problems. He will come back and bring you the earthly promises, but you need your spiritual taken care of before you can uh, enjoy the benefit of the physical, of the earthly. That's what he's saying here, that they refuse to understand that this was their Messiah because they wanted him on their terms. Well, isn't that what we're doing all along when we say, oh, I don't need Messiah, I can keep the law. Or I don't need Messiah, I'm a good person. We're all doing that same thing. When we're coming up to God with anything other than the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus, that's what we're doing. They were seeking God on external rules and rights, and they were missing him. They were doing the sacrifices in not realizing it's pointed to the sacrificed Lamb of God who once and for all died the death that had to be died to take away the sin of the world, never to be repeated again, never to go through a sacrifice system again. But they were missing the spirit of the law that pointed them to it because they were, being, they were holding on to the letter of the law. It's got to be this way, and it's got to be the way we see that it's right, and they were ignorant of the truth of the matter. And verse 3 says that, for not knowing about God's righteousness. What is God's righteousness? Yeshua. That's it. We put on his righteous robe when we come into God's presence. So God's righteousness is Yeshua Jesus, for not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own. See, they're still trying to do it. We can do it on our own. They did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. Okay, they were ignorant. They didn't know. They didn't understand. They didn't have the, right, the righteousness of faith. And so they're going about it again, seeking it on their own, to establish it, to set it up on their own. Again, that's pride. They're doing it themselves. They wanted a monument to their glory rather than to God's glory. When we come and say, Yeshua, Jesus, you did it all, we don't get a bit of the glory. We are on our faces in, in humbleness before our God, glorifying our God in heaven. He gets all the glory. It's not our own private way of doing it, uh, 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 our private possession. No, this is righteousness that is legal. It is legal according to God's standard not according to man's. It is not a self-righteousness. That's why it says they had to submit. They had to subject to God's righteousness. And this in our Greek is a military word, and it means to arrange under. Picture soldiers in a battalion that are coming under their commanding officer. They can't go rogue. They can't go out on whatever they're sent out on and say, well, wait a minute, I'm going to do it my way. Because if they lifted up their head to do that, they would have been the first casualty. 
They have to go in the way that that commanding officer is bringing them together. They have to be obedient. People hate that word. That's a good word. It's a good word to be obedient to our God. And in that obedience, we come into the righteousness of our God by faith. Not by works, not by doing it ourselves, not by any other means. It's all by faith. Remember the end of chapter 9? They were, they were pursuing, but they were pursuing it in their own effort. They were missing it by faith. The Gentiles came in by faith. They were receiving it by faith. God was raising up and is raising up a body of Gentile believers who are receiving it not by coming under the law and keeping the law because they couldn't do it any better than the Jews could do it, but they were coming in in faith. And it is in the righteousness of God that the law is satisfied, that God is satisfied. Verse 4, for Messiah, for Christ, is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Okay, the end means it's the termination or the limit at which a thing ceases to be because it has been satisfied. It has been fulfilled. The goal has been hit. The target was hit. So it's not meaning that now we throw out the law, but what it's meaning is everything that that law was crying out for and pointing to and aiming for, the archer has now, the bow's gone and bullseye. What hit the bullseye? Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus. He's the one that fulfilled the law perfectly. He didn't miss the target by an inch. You can come and put another arrow inside of his arrow. He is in the center of the center of the center. He is right on target. He hit the goal. He hit the aim. He fulfilled the law. And that is where our righteousness comes in because a holy God has to have that law fulfilled. He cannot just decide one day, I'll, I'll just sweep the sin under the rug. I'll change the rules. I'll forget about it. I'll, I'll ease up. I'll make it easier for you. You know, we dumb down things when we think people can't rise up. Well, God didn't dumb down. He sent down his son so that we could rise up. I'm going to take you real quickly to Leviticus, Viacra. Leviticus, whoops, there's not a one in front of it. Leviticus chapter 18. And verse 5. This is Viacra in our Hebrew. Viacra. 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 Via, okay. I need to look at it now and say it right. It's close to that. Okay. But it's not, it's not Viacra today. I can't do it now. Okay. I'm sorry, I'll look it up later and I'll give it to you the right way. Okay, verse Five of chapter 18, so you shall keep my statues and my judgments, by which a man may live if he does them, I am the Lord. That's what Moshe wrote. That's what was described. That they, they shall live by them. They shall keep them. That's a legal righteousness to do and to live. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, no one could. And that's why Moses' law it gave room in it for the sacrificial system of atoning because no one could do and keep the law. Remember when Moshe first got the commandments and the people said, um, all that God said we will hear and we will do. And God said, oh, that they have such a heart to do. <laughs> the heart may want to. The intent might have been good, but they could not do it. So knowing that, we're going back now to uh, Romans, to chapter 10 and verse 6. But the righteousness based on faith speaks, okay? The righteousness by faith is what's going to speak, what's going to be talked about. And it speaks as follows, all right? It says, quote, Do not say in your heart, Who will ascend into heaven that is to bring Christ down? Let me read the whole question to you. We'll come back and divide all this up. Or who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead? But what does it say? 
Okay, what does faith say? Let's go back and understand what it's saying. Don't say in your heart, or stop saying in your heart. Don't think this way, okay? Let me take you to understand what that means. Let's go to Deuteronomy. That's Dabarim. This one I can say. <laughs> the Yakara. I'm almost there in my Hebrew. It's a little tough of a word to right. say in our Hebrew. Rachel, there's a, 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 a lot of interference that I hear, like, uh, um, I don't know, if, does anybody yeah. uh, hear it? I've got others shaking their heads, yes. Yeah, but I can't hear you because it's, it, the interference is, is great. <laughs> okay, did that just start? It just started. Okay. Yeah, it just started. It just started, okay. I have no idea what I did different. Roger? I don't know, I don't know if it's something that is in one of your cables or something that when you make a movement or something, I don't know. I'm not wired to anything, so I can move. In fact, my body is even right here. You through. might be blocking something, that whatever the reception you have. Is this any better? Do you hear any yeah. difference? Okay. This is my mic. It is taped it down. Okay. Is that better? If I keep talking. Right now, I don't hear the interference, but okay. yeah. Okay. It's, it's, it's not good. Okay, I'm going to be watching you all if the interference comes back because this is critical. If you can't hear, we can't get, you know, we've got to be able to hear and understand. If it comes back, do me a thumbs down. Uh-oh, it's back already. Okay. Yeah, okay. it is back. I don't know what it is. Um, I'm going to take this off. I don't know. Roger stepped out of the room. Isn't that the way it always goes? <laughs> And I'm going to try wearing it like I used to do. We found it seemed to be better. Uh oh, there we go. We, it seemed to be better not on me. But let's try this. Am I putting it on right? I can't even see what I'm doing. No. <laughs> Is it? No, I went backwards, didn't I? <laughs> I'm dyslexic. <laughs> You might have to help me out a little bit. There, there. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me now? Is it better now? It's clear. It's, it's clear. Exactly much better. Yeah. Okay. I still got a little bit from a couple of others. It, yeah. It's because the interference is not constantly. I'm wondering. It just comes on and off. I'm wondering. And I'm wondering what's causing it. I can't have when Roger steps back in, I can't have him push on every connection. Right. We have right. We have wires everywhere. <laughs> and I don't begin to know what reaches what. Yeah, I don't need to touch anything. Okay. Uh, 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 am I, sounds, so, uh, sounds okay. Okay, it might even be where I'm standing. It could be Zoom. It could be that Zoom has so many on it that there's interference. It could be the neighborhood be. picked up. We had a crossover with someone else doing Zoom in our neighborhood, and suddenly we had a picture of them, and they had a picture of us <laughs> once. Oh that was God. a shock, oh. and I have no idea who they are any more than they do me, but I'm going to stand to this side and see my Bibles are both wireless. So I don't think they're interfering, but uh, we'll see. You know, maybe just a difference in an angle, and I'll try, yeah. to, I'll try not to move so much. God help me. <laughs> <laughs> I have a hard time being tied down. Okay, then let me back up and say again, the point that I'm really driving home is that this is by faith, that nothing could attain it. Moshe wrote that um, in, in Leviticus, what I had just read, do I still have it here? No, I don't have it here. Um, all right, let me go back to Leviticus 18.5 because I'm not sure you got that. Um, I'm going from Leviticus to... Uh, Deuteronomy that I think I can get back. Maybe I can't on my phone. I was hoping to just hit a back button, but I don't have it showing. So I'll go back again to Leviticus, whoops, Leviticus 18 and verse 5. And if you heard, uh-oh, I just lost a whole, okay, there is something going here because my large monitor is now completely gone. So I can see you in the distance, but I can still see hand movement. So if you need to do a thumbs down again. Roger. 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 There's some technical problem. Thank you. Thank you. Can you step back in? We've lost this monitor, and they alerted oh. me that we were breaking up very badly. They could not hear and understand me. This one died. Okay, and this died. Yeah, they're doing it. Oh, okay. They're, they're finding out online. Okay, but they're having trouble hearing me. I took it off, and I wired it on, put it on to me, because I'm breaking up badly. Where they couldn't even catch my words. That's weird. The battery's strong. Okay. 
Okay, well, do you want to push on wires and I will try to keep going? Yeah. Am I okay right now? Okay, I've got thumbs yeah, up. You are, yes, you okay. are. Okay, okay. And he is troubleshooting, he doesn't just see, but he is going to be trying. So, again, I'll be watching for those thumb movements. Uh, but make them big because you are little tiny, like Brenda complained about in the beginning. Now that's what I have. Okay, and Terry's tummy is down. Is anyone else down? Yeah, I've got two, three that are saying that sound isn't good again, and I'm not moving. So. Okay, Roger's going to try turning something off and back on. Is that any better now? If I keep talking, I've got to talk long enough that you can know if I'm good, give me thumbs up. One thumbs up. Others are down. Two thumbs up, one down. Okay, Terry seems to be having the worst problem, and I know she's had trouble. She tells me she doesn't like Zoom for this. Bless her heart, the one time you get on. <laughs> okay, Roger's trying. I see the puzzled look here. Yeah. Lord God, please either intervene or show mm -hmm. us what to do. So Everything looks good, that's the problem. <laughs> everything looks good. Um, let me try standing this way. I tried. I went for the window to see if that would help. Is it better if I come in this direction? Does this do anything? If I keep talking, am I clear? Am um, I... On my end, I can hear you better on my end. But okay. it seems like these other people are having a hard time. Right, right. Terry in particular seems to be having the worst time, so I'm watching her, but she just gave me a thumbs up now. Is there anyone thumbs down? Hey, can the network on their end too. Yeah. Well, I don't think it's on their end because it's everybody singing, but I do think it could be Zoom and we can't control it. That's what I meant. Oh, okay, yeah. that's what you meant. I thought you meant them, but yeah. It could be a Zoom problem. Let's just pray that the Lord conquers it, and I will stand this way. Um, I've got to reach. If you see me reaching, I'm trying to see people because I'm five feet tall and my equipment's right in my eyeballs now. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, that doesn't matter as long as I can communicate to you all. Um, so in, in Viagra, where we were coming from, in Leviticus chapter 18 and verse 5, we were told, so you shall keep my statutes and my judgments by which a man may live. If he does them, I am the Lord. So the Lord is saying this was the way to righteousness, was to keep his statutes and his judgments. That's what the law of Moses said. Do this, and you'll be considered righteous. But knowing that was impossible, God made the sacrificial system a part of the Mosaic law because of the need for the sacrifices for the forgiveness of the sin. So we realize, keeping the law, no one was able to attain righteousness. And that brings us back where we were going in verse 6 of Romans 10. But the righteousness, based on faith, speaks as follows. Okay, it's going to give us something here. It's going to say, and I did read it, if you didn't hear me, read it real quick on your own, because I'm going to take you back to Deuteronomy, to Davarim chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30, and we're going to look at verses 6 through 8 and 11 through 14. So, Deuteronomy 30, verse 6 says, Moreover, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart, the heart of your descendants, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, so that you may live. The Lord your God will inflict all these curses on your enemies and those who hate you, who persecuted you, and you shall again obey the Lord and observe all his commandments which I command you today. So law was telling us that they had to keep the law. They had to be obedient. They had to observe all that God said. And verse 11 says, For this commandment which I command you today is not too difficult for you nor is it out of reach. It's not in the heaven that you should say, who will go up to heaven for us to get it for us and make us hear it, that we may observe it. Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will cross the sea for us to get it for us and make us hear it, that we may observe it. But the word is very near you, in your mouth, in your heart, that you may observe it. Okay, what is being said here? The implication is... Don't say, 
someone go up to heaven and get it for us that, that we can't do that here on earth because Messiah's already come down from heaven. His personal presence that is necessary for salvation has already happened. He's speaking to the incarnation. God did come down from heaven in the human form of Yeshua Jesus. God slipped into time and space. He put on a face and we call him Yeshua Jesus. That's what we're seeing. And don't let any man sigh and say, there's no deliverance. Somebody's going to go to heaven and do it for us. Yes. So this is preaching the gospel, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Davarim was speak, preaching the gospel. That there is one coming from heaven who will come down, who will do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Yes. So if, if they believe that gospel, that preaching by faith, they didn't have to worry about keeping all the... Well, but they okay. showed their faith by doing the sacrifices. Okay. So they did have to make the sacrifices. They couldn't just say it. They had to show it because so that was under law. Show it by from the basis of faith. From the basis based of faith. On that gospel they heard. Yes, yes. Okay. That believing this is a picture of the one who is coming. Have I lost my audience, Roger? No, they're all there. Okay, so keep going? Yeah. Okay. He's trying all kinds of things, and I can't see you at all now, so I'm going to take it by faith you can hear me. <laughs> so, good question, Arlu. Yes, they were going to show their faith by their works, even as James said later, show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. We're losing everything. We lost three out of four screens. Oh, we're back with, okay, we're back with a big one. Okay, are you hearing? Everybody but Terry. Terry, I don't know what to tell you, and you can't even hear me for me to say that. Hit your, unmute you, you're trying to talk to me, hit your, your, your sound, still muted. I can't hear. You gotta hit your button for sound, she's looking for it I think by, there we go. Uh, it, it, you keep going in and out, and then your screen freezes. Okay, then that does sound like it's a Zoom problem, that yeah. it is not handling the, um, the, yeah. the number, probably, that are trying right. to use it at this point. Um, Lord, please help. Sometimes it can even be the heat, Rochelle. Yeah, it's hot. It's, it's hot, but the internet isn't heat related, so it's more likely the crowd on the band. That you know, the, it's it's like street. being on the freeway at rush yeah. hour, and you've got all these people trying to merge in while you're already on, and you're having to be for your place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're breaking up. Okay. Okay. What's that? A U D. What the? Yeah. Put that back, whatever you did. <laughs> Are you there? <laughs> we're here. Yeah, we're here. <laughs> oh, Lord, please help. Mm -hmm. Whoa. Yeah. I'm trying to speak off. Okay. Can you hear me now? Okay, I got a head shake from Ruth. I've got, I, I guess I need to keep talking. You don't, can't tell in one sentence. So, um, Ann saying it's so-so. Maria, up, down, indifferent. Maria's not even responding, so she's not hearing or she's frozen. Um, okay, unmute Maria, you're telling me now. Rhonda says good. Can't hear you, Maria, even though it says you're not muted. Right. Please, she's talking. Please stop. She's talking, yeah. and it's showing no mic. You know, it's not showing. Oh. It's muted. Okay. She muted. Oh, right. Roger, turn our sound back on. He's saying, "Okay, Maria, good." Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Oh. <laughs> Whoa, yes. <laughs> Very well. Very well. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. Who haven't I heard from? Rhonda, is it good? It's good. Okay. And Ruth, we're still good. All right, Terry, I've given long enough. I'm coming back to you. Any chance it's better? 
It, I can hear you now. Okay. All right, Lord, please keep us connected. We don't need Zoom. We need you, Lord. <laughs> Amen. Okay. Did I mute it now? Yes. Mute it. Go ahead and mute. And that keeps there from being the background interference in your places. Um, if you want to ask a question, you know, raise your hand and, and hopefully I will see you. Roger got a big screen back up for me again. So I can I can see faces better. So, okay. It looks like everybody's muted. Rowena's back. Hopefully she's hearing. Um, I know you're taking care of your mom. We had a big glitch, Rowena. So, okay. She's signaling me that she can hear. Okay. So what we're saying is... <coughs> Dover and Deuteronomy told them that the Messiah was going to come down from heaven to redeem us. That's what was being made clear. That uh, don't say, you know, somebody has to go fetch it for you. The Lord's coming down with it for you. Don't say it's across the sea. We can't reach it. No, he's saying it's so close. It's in your mouth. It's from your heart. You know, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. So it, it can be that close because God said, I will put it in your heart. Amen. Okay, so we see his incarnation, the fact that he was going to come from heaven, enter into the mosaic system, be the sacrifice that he might attain salvation for us. Um, verse 7 says, Who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. Well, what do we see there? The abyss is the bottomless pit, the un unbounded. Uh, the idea is that, that this is the common abode of the dead. It's what I've taught you is called Sheol, where you have the paradise side and you have the suffering side and a great gulf in between the two. And it's saying that, that don't say that Messiah is down in Sheol. We know he did go down into Sheol for us, into the paradise side, and then he came up out of that into the resurrected life. So now we see his resurrection. So we see his own incarnation and his resurrection. There is nothing lacking. He has done it all. And that's what's being said. Remember the question is about the faith. What is faith saying? Faith is saying Messiah came down from heaven. Messiah died on the cross. Messiah went into the paradise of Sheol for three days in the heart of the earth like it was prophesied would happen. And he came back up out of Sheol. <clears throat> abundant resurrection powerful life that he can give that to us now yes amen that's what's already been accomplished and so verse 7 is saying that that is as if uh, that is the same the same thing in verse 6 this has been done it's not too far for you it's not out of reach this is something attainable it's attainable by faith not by works Nobody did by works, but by faith. And we see that as we move on into verse 8. i got to see it. Okay, there we go. Um, I did read all seven. Okay, but what does it say? Okay, what's it referring to? What's the question? What does it say? We're going back to verse 6, where verse 6 says, But the righteousness based on faith speaks as follows. So this righteousness based on faith that's what verse 8 is saying. What does it say? What does it say from righteousness? What does it say from, from, um, from righteousness based on faith? What does it say? It says the word is near you. The message, the message of salvation by faith is very close to you. It is right here. Not up in heaven, not down in Sheol, not across the sea. It is right here. The word is near you. It is even in your mouth, so you're able to speak it. It's in your heart, so you can meditate on it. And, and then it says, um, that is the word of faith. Now, that doesn't mean logos, the word Yeshua. That's just saying that it's a part of speech. It sentences. us. Here is the message, okay? The message is put into words for us. That's how we can speak it, how we can have faith in our heart. That's what it is, the word of faith, which we are preaching. The faith message, the message that it is by faith we obtain salvation. That's what's right here staring you in the face, so to speak. It is right there. That on the basis of that faith, acting in that faith, taking that faith into your heart so that out of your heart your mouth speaks, 
that if you confess with your mouth Yeshua as Lord, Adonai, believe in your heart that God, Yehovah, has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Okay, verse 9, when it starts with the word that, is namely saying the word of faith that Paul has preached to you now, or Paul is preaching this word of faith. What is this word of faith? That if you confess, when you confess, when you are speaking something and you're saying, this is my confession, you're agreeing to something, usually a reference to someone else, you're confessing to them with them. Uh, what we are confessing is that the Lord, Yeshua, Jesus, it is He that did it all. We're not getting to, uh, to our relationship with God by our works. We're getting there by faith. <laughs> That's what the scripture says, and we're in agreement with the scripture. So we're going to confess with our mouth what the scripture says, that the Lord is Jesus, or Jesus is Lord, sorry. Saying, what, what it's saying, the Greek is saying, Yeshua is Adonai. Let me read to you real quick, 1 Corinthians 12.3. 1 Corinthians 12.3. And give me just a moment. We will be there. First Corinthians 12 and verse 3. And I read, Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says, Yeshua Jesus is accursed. And no one can say, Yeshua Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit, by the Ruch HaKodesh. Okay, how can they say Jesus is Lord? And by saying that, you're saying Jesus is God. Lord, he is God, he is... We see his deity. We see the, the fullness. In fact, the Septuagint version, the Greek version off of the Hebrew, uses the word for Jehovah. So what we're saying is we are confessing this Jesus, this Yeshua, who we saw in human form on this earth, he is Lord. He is Jehovah. He is God. That's what we're saying. That we are equating it with him being very God himself. In our Hebrew, we can use the word for, for um, Jesus from our Hebrew is Yahushua. And it means Jehovah saves. God saves. That's what the name Jesus means when you get into the Hebrew root. So what you're confessing with your mouth, you are saying this one in human form that we call Yeshua Jesus, he is Lord, he is Jehovah, he is God. Why is that so important? Because if he is just a human, then he is not able to take away the sin of the world. He would be dying for his own sin because he in his humanness would have sin. No one that is 100% human and human only has ever lived a sinless life. The only one who has lived a sinless life is the one who took on human form but at the same time still was 100% God. It's the God-man called Yeshua Jesus. Fully God and fully man at the same time. So that he came under the law, but he kept the law. He fulfilled every commandment of the law. He never sinned. We even read when he came before those who were trying him that he was silent. And then at one point he, he does speak when he's adjured to speak by the, to the high priest. Had he not answered then... He would have sinned because there was a law that said if you're under the adjournment from, adjournment from the high priest, you had to speak. So we even see his silence was not against the law. His speaking was according to the law. Everything he did, they could not find any true fault in him. They had to hire people to lie about him to say that he was worthy of death. And, of course, Rome, being afraid of an insurrection, was willing to, to go along to, to calm the Jewish frenzy that was crying out for his death because Rome was the one that had that control. But, again, back on track, what we are seeing is you have to recognize 
The only way Yeshua could be the Savior was by being God himself. He was, if he was just mere man, he could not be saving the world. But by being God, and you are declaring that, that's what's coming out of your mouth, that's your declaration. How? How did you get to that point? How did you come to believe it? How did it get put in your heart? By the Ruch Kodesh, by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God, we were told, what was written on stone, God would write on the heart. He would take out the heart of stone and he would put in a heart of flesh. By the Holy Spirit, this has happened. Not that man has earned it, worked it up, not by works, lest any man should boast. That's Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and then read 10 also, because 10 is a great verse too, that God's got a wonderful plan for you. But verse 10 here in Romans going on, so we confess with your mouth, this is 9, Yeshua as Lord. We're saying Jesus is God. Believe in your heart that God, Jehovah, raised Yeshua, the human part, from the dead, then you will be saved. That's the result. That's how we get our salvation, is the confession of our belief, which is by faith, placed in our heart by the Ruch HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. We have to open that door to allow Him to place it in our heart, but that's all we do, is open up to freely receive. Yeah, there's some people who would challenge and say, well, then if it's fully God, then it wouldn't be fair, because... You know, he accomplished all and obeyed, uh, obeyed all the laws mm -hmm. because he had, he was a deity. So when, and then they say, well, you know, you Christians claim he's a Christian or he's a man, fully man, who accomplished it, mm -hmm. but then he had that extra power to do it. And so, but in essence, what, he did. Yeah, so, in essence, he did. Yeah. If he were just a hundred percent human, he wouldn't have been able to do it. So. Well, I usually say, well, that's the sacrifice of God, the Son of God, who sacrificed his life for us here to accomplish it. Yes. So because he knew you couldn't. Right. So he can. Right, right. And Satan can't agree, uh, argue with that. No, no. Because he is free to give it to whosoever he wishes, right. since it was not for him that shed blood that was sinless, he could apply it to anyone and to everyone. So it, it goes back to our for God so loved the world. Yeah. That it is, yes. But he, how did he accomplish it? He did accomplish it by the power of God. Humanly, he could not alone. But by being fully God and fully man together, he was able to accomplish. Right. Because the, the human factor cannot that the human God factor can. Mm -hmm. So it is. It's hard to understand, but this is where our faith steps in. Yeah. It, because, again, we're trying to understand the spiritual on, on uh, earthly understanding. And we do fall short of that. But that's why it is an exercise of our faith. It is that we are believing it. And that's what First Tim says. For with the heart, a person believes. That's the, the mode of thinking that's guided by the object, by the heart. Usually it's touched by the testimony of others. We know that, that as we share our faith, it excites faith in someone else. Remember, God's put that ability for that faith. He gave everyone enough faith to believe that spark that grows when it's exercised. So as we share, as we speak it to someone else who is coming along to this point, it's going to catch on. They're, they're going to hear that testimony of, a, of another, and it will help them believe. For with the heart, a person believes. Not because somebody else said it, not because someone else did it for them. I can't accept it for anyone else. If I could, the whole world would be safe. <laughs> but you have to for yourself. Um, so again, verse 10. With the heart, a person believes, resulting in righteousness. How do you get righteousness? Is the exercise of your faith. By faith, I believe and accept the Lord's righteousness in my place and believe that he's putting his robe of righteousness on me, that I am saved. And that's what it results in, resulting in righteousness. And with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. The mouth only speaks what took place in the heart. But as we speak it, 
there shows our faith. And we want to speak it. We do not want to keep it to ourselves. We want to share it that others might hear and come to believe also. So um, let's look at Matthew 12, 34. And honestly, I don't remember what it says right now, but I put it down that we wanted to look at it. So Matthew 12 and verse 34. I'm sure it has to do with the heart, uh, with mouth. Okay, never mind. Let me just <laughs> read it to you. <laughs> okay. Verse 34, Matthew 12, 34. Uh, oh, okay, because this is Yeshua. He's going after the Pharisees who were trying to trip him up, trying to find what, something wrong with him. They did not like that people were following him. They did not like that he was, was winning souls over. And he calls them out, you brood of vipers, you snakes. How can you, being evil, speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. So what comes out of your mouth is what's in your heart. And that should be a lesson for us today. What's coming out of your mouth? Is it proving your salvation? If it's not, you might need to take a self-examination check here and see. Because again, you don't want to be a professor. You want to be a possessor. There's a world of difference between professing and possessing. Even the demons will say Jesus is Lord, but they're not bowing to him and having him be their Lord. They just know it, but they haven't accepted it. Of course, demons don't get saved, but you know what I'm saying. Verse 11, and I'm looking for a place we can tie up here very shortly. For the scripture says, Whosoever believes in him will not be disappointed. Do you remember that verse? Does that sound familiar? Are we going back to Isaiah again? Yes, we know we are. Isaiah 28, 16 told us that that rock that the Jewish people stumbled over, but not so as to fall where they couldn't get back up. They just stumbled. That, that, that believing in that rock, the one that caused them to stumble at one point because of the lack of faith, that believing, putting faith in that one, they would not be ashamed. They would not be disappointed. When it says this, let me read you first Isaiah 49, 23, and then I'll, I'll make my comment. Isaiah 49 and verse 23. In Isaiah 49 and verse 23, we have... Okay, come on. All right, thank you. A little more. Verse 23. Kings will be your guardians, their princesses, your nurses. They will bow down to you with their faces to the earth and lick the dust of your feet, and you will know that I am the Lord. Those who hopefully wait for me will not be put to shame. And when it says those will hopefully wait for me, when Scripture speaks about a hope, it is a sure hope. It is not how we use it today. Oh, I hope it won't rain, or I hope it won't burn us up. It is a sure hope. We call it a no-so hope. And that's what it's saying. Those who know and are waiting on the Lord, they will not be put to shame. Romans tells us, nine, um, chapter 9, verse 33, where we were earlier, that they would not be put to shame. Isaiah tells us they would not be put to shame. That shame, that disappointment, that's to suffer a repulse in life, to be disgraced, that the idea is to, to blush with shame, utter confusion, frustration to bring to a shameful end. This is not what will happen. When you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart, you will not be put to shame. You will not be embarrassed. God's not going to leave you out there and do away with you. No, you're going to receive by faith the hope, the sure hope of your salvation. That's what is being said here. So that uh, in verse 12 now, and I think this will help us. We'll do 12 and 13, and I think we can stop there and pick up our question at 14 next week. That to, to finish our thought, remember we came in with the question, if the Jew can't be saved by the law now, and the Gentiles got saved by faith, what's that do to the Jew? Is the Jew left out? Is the Jew out in the cold? Is it over and forgotten and done? And now God's got a new people, and he calls them Gentiles, and he's only caring about them. No, verse 12, for there is no distinction between Jew, and you may have Greek, but it means Gentile. 
no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. Okay, there's no difference, there's no distinction, there's no drawing asunder, there's no dividing, there's no way to distinguish. Those two wave lobes looked exactly alike. If you cut them open, they looked alike. If you cut a Jew open and you cut a Gentile open, what comes out of both of them? Blood. It runs the same. That's what God is saying here. There's no difference now between how you get saved. The blood applied is the same blood applied in the same way to both Jew and Gentile. And when that happens, when, when you realize they're the same, why? It's because the same Lord, and this is that deity word again, fully God, fully man, this same Lord is Lord of all. He is the head. He is the one you have chosen to put your faith in. That means you have bowed the knee at him. That means that you are making him Lord of your life. This Lord, the Lord of all, he is abounding riches for all who call upon him. He has all the riches that are needed to bring to us. Is that talking monetary riches? No. That he has also. I often joke when we need something financially, well, Lord, you own the cattle on a thousand hills. Can you sell a cow or two for me? (laughs) We joke that because, yes, he has all the riches that meet all of our needs that way also, but let's keep it in context here. He's talking about how this Lord, who is God, is able to save. There is the bounding and the riches of his grace. And you could even say the riches of his mercy. And it's toward all. He gives grace to all. He doesn't give grace to just the Jew. He doesn't give grace to just the Gentile. He gives grace to both so that all can abound in the richness of salvation. That's what we're seeing here. It's all in all for all. It's not a hierarchy. It's not a different way. There is one name under heaven whereby man can be saved, and that name is Jesus. In Hebrew, it's Yeshua. In English, it is Jesus. Verse 13, and we'll tie it up there. For whoever, who, sorry, for whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's the whole sum of it. If you're Jewish and you call on the name of this one that we've identified as Lord God, I'll put on the word Almighty because that's what rolls out of my tongue. If you put your faith in Him, there is your salvation. And that is true anytime throughout all time. The nation of Israel will be saved. We know that. We will see that in chapter 11 of Romans. That's talking about a national. It's talking about that God never makes the full end of the people, but the individuals that make up the nation of Israel, each individual one is saved by faith. The same faith that we've been talking about that was in Paul's day, that was even all the way back in Abraham's day, that will be true in tribulation days. I'm going to have to pick up this one to read my final scripture. The other one just choked and froze. I don't think our equipment's having a good day. Joel 2, Lord God gives back together a person. (laughs) It's coming, folks. It's coming. Hang in there. No one can want it worse than Rochelle. (laughs) Joel 2, and we're going to read verses 30 to 32 just real quickly. This is called the day of the Lord. Those of you who have been with me know the day of the Lord is referring to a specific time. It's referring to a time that starts with the tribulation and carries on through the millennial time. This is the beginning of it. It says, "I uh, I will display wonders in the sky and on the earth, blood, fire, calms the smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it will come that whoever, I'm sorry, it will come about, that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be delivered or will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there will be those who escape, as the Lord has said, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls. What is he saying? 
even in this time that will finally cause those to, to cry out to me for salvation, there will be those who will be delivered. There will be those who will be saved because I always said I'll have that remnant. So that's what we are seeing, that what's here for salvation today is the same that's being applied to the end of that age, just before we go into the millennial kingdom also. Salvation is the same way, by faith in Yeshua Jesus as very God himself. And the same way they were saved in the past, they made the sacrifices looking forward as a picture of faith believing. Remember, go all the way back to Abraham, before Moshe, before the sacrificial system. God showed him the gospel in the stars. He showed him what would be coming. And it said that, that it was reckoned that Abraham believed, and it was reckoned unto him for righteousness. You're not saved by believing you can have a big family. That was true, too, the promise given to Abraham of his descendants. But what saved him was righteousness righteousness in the faith of the Lord who would come. Abraham looked and said, I believe in your day, Lord. I believe that you're coming. In Moshe's day, they had to make those sacrifices, saying, there's coming a sacrifice, one called the Lamb of God. And that one will take away the sin of the world. Isaiah 53 gives us the fullness of that. In Yochanan John, we have chapter 1, verse 29. Yeshua is stepping in his ministry right in the beginning. And John says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now we have on the other side, he has died. He was buried. He was resurrected. He's furthermore ascended into heaven. And Shaul Paul has come up after this time and is now saying, You're saved by faith in him. Looking back now and believing in his atoning work. How are we saved in 2020? Are we saved by doing our good works? Are we saved by keeping the Mosaic law? Because now with the Spirit in us, we can do better? No, no. Yes, true, we can do better with the Spirit in us, but we don't get the Spirit in us until we come by faith believing that the Lord did it all, that it is He who did it. We cannot earn it. We can't keep it even. It's the Lord in us who does it all. That's what Shaul Paul is saying here, that there's one way throughout time for salvation, and it's in the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus. Whether you were prior looking forward or whether you're at the time of Yeshua Jesus or now looking back, one name under heaven whereby man must be saved, and that's the name Yeshua Jesus. Amen and hallelujah, because if it were dependent on me, I would tremble on my best day. I would tremble on my knees that I know I'm not equal to a perfect and holy standard set down by a holy God who can accept nothing less. But God does not look at Rochelle in her humanity. He looks at her wearing the robe of righteousness that Yeshua Jesus puts on me when I come into his shed blood by faith. That's worth another hallelujah, and I encourage you all again, make sure you have personally asked him to come in, be Savior, to be the one who saves you from the condemnation by his work. Accept it by faith. You don't have to ask again and again and again. You have to ask once. You have to do it with your whole heart. You can't do it with the brain. Only you have to be exercising the faith of the heart. I believe it and I am accepting it that I bring that opening my heart door. That Holy Spirit, Ruach HaKodesh, promised us when Messiah went back into heaven, you can take out my heart of stone that wants to be obedient to that law, maybe even, but it's still a heart of stone, even at its best. And I'm, by virtue of the Holy Spirit, He'll put in that heart of flesh so that now by His power, we're able to begin to be conformed to his image. And one day, when we go home, we are put in through, as I picture as we go through the heavens, whoosh, the robe of righteousness comes on to us as we're changed from mortal into immortal, as we put on the holiness of our God to go into his very presence. 
he did it all. What a beautiful picture of salvation to the Jew and to the Gentile. Both in God's eternal plan, both loved, both on equal footing, not one better, not one forward and one behind. We are together equal in this. And again, hallelujah, it is free for us. I'm going to close this in prayer, and then I'm going to open up mics, and we'll pick up, and we'll look at the very next question. I don't even have Romans now in front of me. Um, I know 14 starts with a question. Can I get it? How will they hear without a preacher? Is that what it says? Anyone in my audience here have it open? <laughs> if not, I'm not uh, up. Really. I, I have it open, and it says... Um, Thank you, Maria. Will they call on him in whom they have not believed? Okay. How will they call on him in whom they haven't believed? See, they're going to have to exercise that faith. But we're going to go on and we're going to see who it is that can do that. We're going to go into um, what God's plan of Israel still is because we're saying God's not done. It's not over. And so we have some exciting times to come, some wonderful things to look at. And then, oh, wait a minute. If it's not over for the Jews, then how do the Gentiles fit in here? <laughs> Believe me, dear beloved Gentiles, you're in there all the way too. But we'll take it and we'll see a beautiful picture in its entirety for all. So let's close in a word of prayer. I'm sorry it is slightly late, but that's due to our big hiccup in the middle. Um, and we'll pick up with verse 14 and that question next week. Adonai Yeshua, our Lord Jesus. And yes, we are calling you Lord as in Lord God Almighty, Adonai Sabaot, the Lord and of all the heavenly hosts, the Lord that is above heaven and below the earth, the Lord who is greater than all the been created. You are our creator God and we thank you and we praise you that you want a relationship with your creation of humanity. That you have opened the door for salvation for us. That you are the one to whom we look. That we do not earn it. We don't work it up and then manage to even keep it Lord God. Thank you that you did it all and you freely give. And Lord God again let each one within hearing of this voice, both now when it goes out over the recorded airwaves, Lord, let any who have only known it in their head and not opened up their hearts, let them even at this moment now open up their hearts, receive you as Savior, put you as Lord, as head of their life, except by faith that you did it all, that they too might have the joy of their salvation, even now, fully realize when we're home, the walking in empowerment in this life now. Lord God, we say hallelujah. We thank you. You did it all. You gave us our salvation. You made the way possible, and you keep us in it forever. And we praise you, thank you, and we humbly call you Lord, Lord God, our Savior. In your name, we give thanks, we give praise forever and ever and ever, and a thousand times aren't enough to say it. Thank you, praise you, hallelujah, Diana. You are an amazing, awesome, and equitable God, and we thank you. Jesus, in your precious name, amen. 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 Hallelujah. What a class. We conquered even. So, <laughs> comments, questions, feedback.